Bienvenidos a Los Angeles. Welcome to Los Angeles by Lisa Cole. Exterior LAX Airport, Los Angeles, California, evening 2018. An Aeromexico plane approaches LAX to land. Barbed wire fence projects the tarmac from trespassers. Roundups targeting undocumented immigrants leave Southland families on edge this evening. Interior medical office, same. Imani, 23, Tanzanian in medical scrubs, works alone. She grooves to bongo flava music via earbuds while powering down computers and lights. Behind her, the news on a TV. Dozens of arrests are made as the president promises the deportation of millions. Imani's phone rings. She FaceTimes with Kafil, three. They speak in Swahili. Hey, love. How was your day? Oh, come home, mommy. I'm hungry. Young Nelly's making dinner, Kafil. I want pizza. Not today. I'll be home soon. Gerald, 40s in a suit, pokes his head around the corner. Imani, good, you're still here. Uh, swing by on your way out. Interior medical office, Gerald's office, moments later. Imani sits in a chair opposite Gerald, who shifts uncomfortably behind his desk. Imani holds a letter in her hand from Immigration Services. She fights tears as she reads the words, terminated, two weeks to leave the country, unlawful president presence. But why? I was so close to getting my green card. My guess is it has something to do with the Muslim ban. I'm sorry, Imani, but we can't keep you here. Imani is devastated. Gerald hands her her business card. This is the name of a good immigration attorney. I wish there was more I could do. Interior, exterior, Uber medical office, parking lot, moments later. Sufi rock music on, oh, excuse me, Sufi rock music on low in the vehicle. Imani fastens her seatbelt. She glances at her rideshare companion, Elizabeth, 25, Latinx, who types a text into her phone. An overstuffed duffel bag crowds the seat between them. Imani notes a small toy car on top. Elizabeth's brief smile belies her grave demeanor. Orafa, 50, female South Asian driver, eyes Imani in the rear view mirror as she puts the car in gear. Who stops first, then Alex? Imani nods. She notes photos of three young children taped to the dash. A Hamza necklace hangs from the mirror. Elizabeth stows her phone, then wrings her hands. The women ride in silence as the vehicle travels in traffic. Imani stares out the window, a thousand miles stare. They say it might rain, but it's always sunny in LA. They drive a moment more. A Rafa'a's phone rings. She answers. Hello? How do I know where your homework is? Ask mommy. I'll be home soon. She hangs up and shakes her head with a smile. <laughs> Three grandkids. Someone always needs something. The traffic moves slowly. Rafa honks the horn. Elizabeth strains to see up ahead. What time is your flight? Elizabeth speaks in broken English. My son's coming from Mexico. How long has he been there? Elizabeth hesitates, assessing the two strangers with her. I haven't seen him in five years. Oh, my goodness. How old is he? Six. Amani and Arapa share a look in the mirror. Well, I bet you are so happy. Tears well in Elizabeth's eyes. My son, Chris, was born here. He has papers, but when I go into the airport, ICE will arrest me. Her words hit Amani hard. You don't have anyone who can go for you? Elizabeth shakes her. My cousin Miguel has papers. He was supposed to go, but Ice went to his work this morning and now he doesn't answer. No, I heard about the raids on the news. Imani watches Elizabeth check her phone messages. Nothing. And your son's on the plane already? Elizabeth nods yes. The traffic takes on new urgency. A Rafa honks again, searching for a way forward in a sea of cars. Immigration is such a mess in this country. I came from Bangladesh 19 years ago, got my permanent visa, got my permanent resident card. I never thought about politics or anything until Obama. I got, I got so excited. I registered to vote and they let me vote. Then they tell me I break the law. I can never become a citizen because of one mistake. Why do they call it permanent resident anyway? It's crazy. 
What can you do? Imani's wheels spin. Elizabeth shows her a photo of Chris on her phone. Imani shows Elizabeth a photo of Kafiu. The women share a moment. Imani taps on a Rafa'a's seat. She speaks with resolve. You can't forget my stop. Head straight to LAX. They're not going to deport you. I can go in and get Chris. I'll get your son. It's okay. I want to help. This is home. Interior, exterior, Uber Century Boulevard. Later, all three women on edge as they approach the airport. Give me your number. How do you say, welcome to LA? Bienvenidos a Los Angeles. Bienvenido Los Angeles. Sí, pero bienvenidos a Los Angeles. Bienvenidos a Los Angeles. Bienvenidos a Los Angeles, Chris. You speak good. Imani lets out a nervous laugh. Elizabeth smiles. Interior, exterior, Uber, LAX airport. Arrivals moments later. Arafa pulls over to the curb outside the terminal. Good luck. Imani turns back. Elizabeth hands her the toy car. Elizabeth and Arafa watch Imani disappear inside the terminal. Black Butterflies by Tamara S. Hall. Interior, hospital corridor, day. Sienna approaches Ray, who is speaking to the young nurse in a frustrated tone. I know it's only been a few minutes, but you're not seeing what I'm seeing. One of y'all at least check on her until Doc has free. Stacy, room two. Stacy, our young nurse, turns back to face Ray. Mr. Davis, as I stated before, we're moving as fast as we can. Unfortunately, James is not the priority right now, but the doctor has been made aware. Nurse Stacy turns and strolls down the long corridor. Ray points to a pair of nurses chatting in the corner. And what about them over there? You telling me they can't come, Chick? One of the nurses glances at him. Sienna steps closer. What'd she say? Said toy is in priority. As if the words set him ablaze once again, he strolls off. Deanna drifts down the corridor. Someone who can. A male doctor exiting a room catches Sienna's attention. His eyes are glued to a chart. Sienna approaches. Excuse me. He glances at her and smiles back to the chart. Hi, sorry to interrupt. My sister just got out of labor. She's been in pain ever since. I, I think she's about to pass out. You think you can Which room? Six, Toya Jack James. I'll have a nurse check her vows. Finally looks up from the chart, except to walk away. Interior hospital room, day. Santa trudges into the room. Ray caresses Toya's arm as he sits by, oblivious to... Baby, hey, how you feel? Easy. I saw a doctor... He sent a nurse. Nurse should have been in here. Dana approaches the bed and studies Toya. You said you're dizzy? Didn't Serena Williams? She rapidly keys her phone. Close on the phone and Sienna types dizzy, faint after labor into a search engine. She presses the search bus button. Ray continues to rub Toya's arm. Hmm. Okay. Maybe I'm overreacting. What's up? It's saying it could be a, a case of vertigo, which is considered normal, you know, due to hormonal fluctuations, or it, it, it could be something more serious. Serious like what? Say she ain't have pre-existence? Buzz, Ray's phone vibrates loudly in his pocket. He yanks it out and looks at it. Pops keep calling. I'll go check the nurses again while I'm out there. Ray leaves the room. Sienna turns to Toya, who looks to be fighting sleep. She glances at her phone again, puts it away, stands. Amy, it's okay? Boy, it's probably a good idea to get rest. I can't imagine how tired you are. 
Anna goes to adjust the sheet, partially covering Toya's body. As she lifts the seat, she sh sees a pooling blood stain. Interior, hospital room, night, dream. The nurse shoves a bloody white blanket into Sienna. Interior, hospital room, day. Sienna gasps and drops the sheet as if it's diseased. She quickly scans the room, takes the Toya, then panic. Sienna darts out of the hospital room. Interior, hospital corridor, continuous, and spots Ray, who's engrossed in a phone conversation a few feet away. She approaches. Ray, there's blood. It's all over. All those stories I read about women having complications, some, I think it's happening with Toy. Oh my God, we need a doctor now. Up the phone mid-conversation. Yana, calm down. Let me go check. Ray slips a few feet away into the room. Sienna, breathing hard, looks around. She freezes and zones in on the older nurse we heard earlier. She's walking in the opposite direction of Sienna. Sienna catches up to her. Ma'am, please, we need a doctor. In room six, my sister, she's bleeding. We've been waiting a while. The older nurse, still walking, glances over at Sienna. She sizes her up as if she's seen this type of panic before. She gives Sienna a moment to breathe, and then... Room six, that's Miss James, right? Yes. Yeah. We have a doctor on it. He'll be in shortly. If you could come look at her, or, or get someone to come look at Heather in the meantime, are you short-staffed around here? I'm sure it seems that way to all of our vigilant family members. I will say, ma'am, that Lokia is normal after birth. Lokia? The vaginal discharge after labor. The body rids itself of the extra blood, tissue, and... No, 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 no. This is only blood. What part of that are you not understanding? Who do I need to talk to to get a doctor? Ray's footsteps uh, approach. Older nurse finally halts and takes the panic-stricken family in. All right, just relax and head on back to the room. I'll have the staff order a CAT scan. I need that done now. I Am a Gentleman by Nikki Colloway. Interior anti-harm class morning. Max looks exhausted. He hasn't gotten any sleep. Today, class, we have a very special guest, a representative from Tundra Incorporated. Please welcome Damien Small. Damien Small enters the classroom. Thank you, Mr. Hardman, for the introduction. Hello, boys. What a fine group of young men. Have you all been studying hard? Not a few enthusiasts. That's good, because I'm here to talk to you about what happens if you don't study. Any guesses? We go to jail for first degree murder. Bingo. Thought you have nothing to worry about. Pink Jersey quickly hides his notebook of violent sketches depicting other boys. No one notices. Now, I know that seems unfair. Why should you be punished for what's happening chemically in your brain and in your body? The hormones raging through you right now are three times more potent than that of your female counterparts. Why should you pay the price for taking care of your needs? Why should you be afraid of expressing yourself and what you feel? Because... In Expo Marker, he writes out, it is not socially acceptable. It is not socially acceptable. I promise, once you get these first few years of anger, rage, and violence out of your system, using the techniques in your anti-harm handbook, you will be a well-adjusted young gentleman, fitting in seamlessly with the rest of society. He takes a chair and sits on it backwards, cool guy style. Now, I want to share a personal story with you all. I was your age when I started feeling urges like the ones listed in the handbook. I was always sweating, feeling nervous around girls, wanting to cave their heads in with a hammer. Teenage boy stuff. But luckily, I'm from a generation that had the anti-harm program as part of my curriculum. I struggled with the shame and homicidal feelings all through my teens and into my 20s. 
and the handbook saved me from going down the rabbit hole. When I almost ran over my fiance with a two-ton pickup, I used the gentleman technique to bring me back to my breathing, to the present moment, and to who I truly am inside, a gentleman. And that's when I joined Tundra Incorporated. I found a job that could really make a difference in the world. Now I and a team of others work tirelessly to figure out better techniques every day to make things a little easier for you guys. Because it's not the girl's fault if she wears a short skirt. She's not asking for it. She's... That's in unison. Expressing, expressing herself herself in a way in that will fade with the fade deterioration of her youth and immaturity. That's right. Yes. What? Yes. What happens if the feelings never go away and you can never love anyone because you lack the respect and intimacy that's needed to make a healthy relationship work? Hmm. Have you been doing the mirror technique? Yes. Every time you see your reflection three times or more? Yes. Then, by the official evaluation of our government's mental health board, those feelings are bound to cease. Just keep saying the words until you make them true. Interior boys' restroom day. Max is in the bathroom alone. He's scrubbing his hands harshly and compulsively as he repeats over and over. I am a gentleman, and I have no need to harm. I am a gentleman, and I have no need to harm. I am a gentleman. I am a gentleman. I am a gentleman. Exterior school grounds afternoon. Max bounds down the steps to Charlotte. Hey. Oh, hey. They walk down the street side by side. She lets him walk closer. I saw that Tundra guy go into your class. Yeah, he was pretty lame. What did he talk about? Jail, mostly. What did you do today? Oh, um, we dissected a frog in biology, and I had a self-defense class last period. Oh, that's cool. Can you show me any moves? <laughs> no, I'm not good at anything yet. Max blocks her way playfully. She tries dodging him. He blocks her again. They both smile. Give me your best karate chop. Try and punch me. I can't do any of that. We're only taught defense, not offense. That's boring. Hey, do you want to come over to my house? We could study or, like, play video games. I'm not sure if that's a good idea. No, it's fine. I see you just as a friend, you know? You're like a guy to me. Are you sure? Absolutely. I give you full permission to put me in a chokehold if I try to hold the door open for you. My Black Friend by James Martin Did you ever think your Halloween costume might be racist but weren't quite sure why? Or maybe you just want someone to explain the latest episode of HBO's Insecure. We have exactly what you need. Welcome to My Black Friend. Okay, you got my attention. Is this some sort of new app? So much more. My Black Friend is an exclusive, personalized concierge service that matches you with your ideal Black friend, letting you prove to everyone just how open-minded and culturally literate you are. Concierge approaches Kenzie and Becca. They follow the concierge out of the lobby. Interior interview area, moments later, Becca and Kenzie sit eagerly speaking with the concierge who takes notes on a tablet computer. The MBF experience starts with a detailed analysis of your interests. All your likes, dislikes, hopes, and dreams play a factor in finding you the perfect black friend. Interior MBF lab. Becca and Kenzie watch eagerly as the concierge points out images on a computer screen. The concierge turns to camera. After that, our propriety algorithm searches our database for black friends, ideally suited not only for who you are, but also where you are in life. But how can I be sure? I mean, can a computer program really find the right black friend for me? Interior showroom. Darren stands patiently as Becca and Kenzie walk in again. Excellent questions. Our process takes into account your preferred level of comfort with black folks. Graphics appear next to Darren, highlighting his words. After filtering for cultural appropriation, implicit bias, and fetishism, it determines the proper level of friendship, from casual acquaintance to ride or die. Ooh. Ooh. 
Plus, each of your potential new BBFFs is thoroughly versed in math, science, literature, politics, world cultures, and current events in order to easily navigate any social environment. Different Black people appear next to Darren as he lists categories. A male Black activist in protest t-shirt appears. Whether you want to appear a recently woke. A female Black activist with a bullhorn mask t-shirt and a protest sign reading, White Women Elected Trump. Or fully down for the cause. A handsome young brother, 20s, appears. Maybe you want revenge on your ex-boyfriend from freshman year. What's up, girl? A glamorous young sister, 20s, replaces the young brother. Or your ex-boyfriend from sophomore year. What's up, girl? It could be as simple as upsetting your grandparents. Corey, 20s, dressed in slacks, buttoned down in a tie, appears. Or even testing tolerance levels at home. For example, Corey here is a West Point grad an avid golfer, and loves reruns of The Office. He's also a devout Christian who volunteers at the local homeless shelter. A pleasure to meet you, ladies. Yet, even some otherwise progressive parents will still find they're just not quite sure about him. What if I really want to go all out? Like, where money is no object? Then you'll want to go with our Platinum VIP service, which includes one standard Black friend, one annual cookout invitation, and the option to enlist one of our most elite Black friends. A Black Republican in a suit and glasses appears. First, there's the ultra-rare Black conservative Republican, a disciple of the same pull-yourself-up-by-your-bootstraps philosophy and reductive thinking about minorities as your most embarrassing uncle. That might be going too far. We really need to look at the problems in our own community. Yeah, no. Honestly, we don't get many takers for them. The amount of self-loathing involved pretty much guarantees conflict with your other new Black friends. We recommend working up to this level. The Black Republican vanishes. Darren turns up the sales pitch. Then there's what so many dream of. The pinnacle in Black companionship. Someone who can teach you about your culture and teach you about yourself. Give you sage advice while never being afraid to drop some hard truths. All while making sure you feel completely loved and just slightly superior. You don't mean... A magical Negro, older Black woman in vintage outfit appears wearing a hat and carrying a walking stick. Uh, yes! That time-honored icon of wisdom and guidance, the magical Negro. A man who don't understand where he's been... It's going to find it hard to know where he's going. I didn't think that was still possible. Well, nearly anything's possible if you believe in yourself. Wait, where'd she go? Was she ever really here? Oh, oh wow. wow. Are you ready to prove to the world how totally not racist you are? Sign me up. Yeah, this is so exciting. If you'll follow me. Interior doorway. The concierge leads Becca and Kenzie away. Hypothetically, if I pay for the full platinum VIP level, is there any way I get to say... Becca whispers to the concierge. I promise you don't have enough money. Interior showroom continuous. Expand your social circle and your social consciousness by joining today. My Black Friend, where it's always about you. On-screen graphics, My Black Friend, it's always about you. Pink Crocs by Timothy Patrick Hughes. Interior locker room moments later, Caleb sits on a bench watching the gang. His eyes widen warily when Brick pulls a pink spray paint can out. So once we take him inside, you go decorate his new shoes. It would be freaking hilarious. I don't know. Haven't he had enough? I mean, we're friends, right? Yeah. Good. Because this, uh, this is the sort of thing friends do for each other. And if, if you didn't do it, uh, I don't know. I'd feel like you weren't our friend. Caleb's smile fades. Exterior alleyway later, Jesse's navy water shoes lay on the blacktop. Caleb stands over them, clutching the can. Then he covers his eyes and sprays it wildly. Interior school pool later. Caleb hides in the pool and peers over its edge. Jesse, grinning with ease, strolls into the room with the gang. He stops when he spots his 
newly spray painted pink water shoes on the ground. Caleb watches as Jesse plods over and picks up his shoes. Who did this? Pinky, damn, I love your shoes. Oh, those are so cute. Where can I stop and cop a pair? Tears stream down Jesse's face. Caleb watches dismayed. Who did this? More boys join in the laughter. What's wrong? Isn't that how you like them? Ooh! Feet. I did. Caleb's out of the pool looking at Jesse. His feet are pink. I'm so sorry, Jesse. Jesse stares at him, raging. He steps toward him and then turns around to the crowd. The sound cuts out as he roars, fuck you, at them. Then he sprints at them and slips on a wet tile. The sound comes back in his head as he cracks into the ground. Blood bursts out. Jesse whimpers and erupts into bitter sobs. The boys stare. Interior locker room later, Caleb looks out the exit door as paramedics wheel Jesse into an ambulance and drive him away. Caleb turns back inside. All the boys, including the gang, glare at him. My feet. Well, now it was me. It was us. What do you mean, us? And with that, they all desert him. Caleb watches them go. Interior moments later, Caleb sits hunched over on the ground, scrubbing his pink feet pathetically with his towel. It's barely coming off. Caleb! Caleb turns. His mom stands behind with his coach, shocked. Interior Caleb's bedroom, night. Caleb sits on his bed and his mom sits at the other end, staring at him. You lied to me. His dad leans against the wall behind his wife. Marie, relax. I need to relax? Phil, do you not understand what happened? It was a prank that went south. Look, it's happened to me too. Don't minimize this, Phil. Our son sent that kid to the hospital. Well, obviously he didn't intend to, but what are you going to do? Pull him off the team? Yeah, that's exactly what I'll do. <laughs> if that's what you want to do, just do it. All right, what, what are you going to get out of grilling the poor kid? The truth. I'm talking to you, Caleb. Start talking. I wish I never got those gay ass shoes. Wait, shoes? What, what shoes? Caleb reaches under his bed, pulls out a shoe box, and throws it onto his bed. The pink Crocs tumble out. They, they made me feel so stupid and, and small. So, I, so I, I didn't mean for anyone to get hurt. Dad steps over and picks up the shoes. He turns to his wife. You bought these for him? Yeah, he wanted them. Dad tosses them back on the bed. <laughs> Fantastic. So, so I guess the next time when he wants a Barbie, you'll buy that for him too? Cut it out, Phil. What are you trying to teach our son, huh? What are you trying to teach our son? Why can't you just accept him for who he is, Phil? Dad shakes his head and turns gravely to his son. Caleb, buddy, listen up. If you don't want to get picked on, you're not going to wear stuff like this. Do you understand? Phil, for the love of God, please just leave. Yeah. Dad looks at her, then he trudges off, stops, and turns back. You know what? I'm throwing these out. Dad grabs the shoes. Caleb reaches out desperately. Caleb. <laughs> you still want these? He stares at his son, shakes his head, drops them, and leaves. Caleb reaches over and holds onto his shoes protectively. Mom watches her son and then sighs and rests her hand on him. You keep the shoes, Caleb. When you're ready, you wear them. You go back to that boy and you make this right. She stares him in the eyes. He looks back and nods. She then leans down and plants a kiss on his head. She exits the room, leaving him alone with his pink Crocs. Rain by Diane Russo Chang and Bon Bon Chang. Interior, Yonkers Police Athletic League, small gym, later. A training montage, jump rope, burpees, shadow boxing, Turkish setups, with Lynn barking out instructions, and Esme with single-minded focus. The doors open. Her opponent, Chin Wei. Wiry, kind of butch. Younger and smaller than Esme. Eyes forever sizing you up. Can I help you? My bad. Wrong room. Hey. Can I shake your hand? What? I just wanted to shake the hand of a legend, you know, uh, before it gets real. Lynn warms up to this, reaches out her hand, and Jin Wei takes it with gusto. 
I saw your WKO match against Sarah Cage when I was 12. That takedown, it got to me. That's why I started fighting. I want to be like you. Esme stopped doing sit-ups, irritated. Keep going, Es. You're holding your own. Anyway, it's an honor. You too. It's crazy to me. I'm going for the title against Esme Washington. I mean, fucking privilege. Esme gives Chinwei the same polite, professional smile she gives co-workers. Chinwei takes in the scene. Well, um, I- I'm going to leave y'all to it. See you in the ring. She leaves. She psyched us out. Rope. Five minutes. As he grabs the rope, a knock at the door. It's one of the coordinators. Esme, they need you out there. Esme exchanges a look with Lynn. Interior, Yonkers, police, athletic lead, main hall, moments later. Esme, mind if I ask you some questions? You don't mind me stuffing my face? She struggles down the sandwich like she hasn't eaten solid food in days, which she hasn't. You're a veteran fighter defending this championship, but you're also competing with a star 14 years younger who's undefeated up and down the West Coast. See yourself as the underdog? See myself as a fighter. Cut to Chin Wei on the other side of the room, interviewed by a different journalist. She's one dimensional, same moves. Right hook, roll under, right hook, roll under. Esme's interview. She's a puppy, doesn't know how to conserve. I'll let her tire herself out and then I'll go in hard. Nobody likes to lose, so I'll have to, you know, show her the door. Oh, I'll share with her my wisdom. I hope she learns. All right, we gotta wrap this up. Okay, one last question. Uh, you're being trained by the Lynn and uh, Swasson here, who you defeated into retirement. Does that make you feel pressure? No. Okay, if, if you lose any plans, will you follow in her footsteps, become a mother of Muay Thai? Bye, Frank. Uh, okay, have a good fight. Okay, where's your head at? In the ring. Okay, good. Keep it there. Is May you need it at the medic station? Why? The coordinator shrugs as he leads them to interior registration and medic station, where the nurses are busy taking blood pressure. On seeing Esme, one of the nurses hands her a pregnancy test. Esme need to take a pregnancy test. Oh, I'm, I'm up to date. My physical, it's, it's random. You know how it goes. Esme reluctantly takes it. She heads into the bathroom. Lynn stands right outside, clutching a bagged sandwich in one hand. Interior bathroom stall moments later. Esme stares at the unused pregnancy test. Her hands shake. She stares in middle distance, breathing in and exhaling, trying to control her anxiety. Interior registration and medic station. Esme emerges from the bathroom. Betty? Um, yeah? Can't pee. I, I just dropped like two pounds in two hours. It, it's it's like a desert in there. The grabs two bottles of water and hands them to her. No nonsense. Esme moves to the side several feet from the medics. Lynn follows close. What's up? You okay? Esme chugs water, keeping an eye on the nurse. I can't take the test. Why not? Lynn stares at the unused pregnancy test for a second before it sinks in. Damn it. You sure? I'm late. Really late. And I'm not crying. I swear. We have to forfeit. They'll make you forfeit. They find out. Oh, the shit we do for this fucking sport. Lynn disappears into the locker room as me continues to drink with nothing better to do for now. The Break App by Allison Zada. It says we can buy more time. In our relationship? As an in-app purchase? Yeah, but it's nine ninety nine. 
Are you saying we're not worth nine ninety nine? I'm saying it's a lot of money for a scam. Okay, what if it's not a scam? Okay, but if we're about to break up, then why? Clearly, that means there's something wrong that we're not talking about. So let's talk about it. All the possible reasons to break up on the table now. Brutal honesty. This seems like a terrible idea. Got a better one? Let's do it. Interior bedroom a few moments later, a series of shots, brutal honesty, an on-screen timer counts down from 13 minutes, skipping ahead between interactions. The X. I won't talk to him anymore if it makes you uncomfortable. I didn't know it bothered you. It doesn't bother me. I just I sometimes wonder if you wish you were still with him. Don't. Or, or, if I, or if I were more like him, with, with the big money job and the fancy sunglasses and all that? I don't. Instagram. I didn't ask you to unfollow her. I would never do that. She got a dog. That's the only reason I liked it. You know I only like pictures of other girls if there's a dog in them. The marriage talk. So, you do want to get married. And have kids? Yes, I think so at some point, but not like immediately. I don't want to immediately either, but but I want to. I know, so do I. I'm like 95% sure, but basically 100. Okay, so we'll figure it out? We'll figure it out. Stuffed animal. You're a 30-year-old woman who still sleeps with a teddy bear. The texture helps me relax. What are you thinking about? Okay, most of the time, I'm not thinking about anything. Maybe fantasy football or trying to decide if I'm hungry. But there's no secret thought process I'm, I'm not telling you about or something. Spoilers. I'm not trying to be annoying. I just get excited when I figure out the twist before the end of the movie. Yeah, but, like, I want to be surprised. I, I get that you're smart, okay? You don't need to prove it all the time. Stand up versus improv. Of course I think you're funny. I just don't know if stand up is right for you. I dated a comedian once, and he was terrible, and I had to go to all of his shows. I'll never get those hours back. Yeah, okay, says the person who's obsessed with improv. How many hours have I spent watching terrible heralds for you? <laughs> Improv is different. Dinner. I honestly very rarely care what we have for dinner. I just don't want to be the one who has to decide. The noise. What? This? <laughs> yes, that. I hate it. I hate it. It. Love languages. And I get that yours are physical touch and acts of service, but mine is words of affirmation. So I just need to hear you say it now and then, okay? Like in a serious, non joking way. Like how Matthew does it to Mary. So British and dead. This is exactly what I'm talking about. Down the line. I guess I always tell myself moving back to Michigan eventually, honestly. But all my family's here. But all my family's there. Less action. I find you very attractive. I'm just tired, like, all the time. <laughs> Thank God. Me too. Emma Watson. I'm not in love with Emma Watson. But you think she's pretty. Of course I think she's pretty. Everyone in the known universe thinks she's pretty. But that doesn't mean I want to sleep with her. 
So you wouldn't sleep with her if you had the chance. This 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 feels like an entrapment, okay? I, I, I just mean that on the off chance, I happened to meet Emma Watson and she happened to try to seduce me, which she wouldn't do, I would not sleep with her because I'm in a committed relationship with you. <laughs> I don't want to hold you back. God, you're ridiculous. He pulls her into a one-armed hug. Now, Phoebe Waller-Bridge, on the other hand. Girlfriend hits him with her teddy bear. Interior bedroom after the brutal honesty. They look at their phones. The countdown has reached zero. It's over. Did we beat it? Or did it just finish? I don't know. Nine ninety nine wasted. The music lesson by Victor Dean. Interior, School for Creative and Performing Arts, Band Rehearsal Studio, Day. An ample rehearsal space. The room has soundproof walls positioned in jazz band fashion, are a drummer, upright bass, piano, and a small horn section playing an up-tempo piece of music. We see Eddie, who is directing the musicians, standing atop the conducting podium. In the corner of the room is Mr. Milner, the music teacher, with his eyes closed and rocking to the music. Suddenly, a man enters the room looking to interrupt the rehearsal. Eddie puts his hands up to stop the music. Mr. Milner hops up from his desk to address the principal of the school, Mr. Drummond. Gray suit looks once or two sizes too big for him. The room is silent now. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Eddie walks to the players. He's looking like he wants to solve a problem. The students' eyes are fixed on Eddie. Drums, uh, remember the snare back, uh, backbeat is on the three bass. Please find that pocket with the drums. You're rushing just a bit. And piano, I want those articulations. Use the front end of the, your hand. Mr. Miller is coming in a warm manner. Mr. Milner, can I have a word with you? Outside. The room is as cold as ice with the presence of Mr. Drummond. The two men step out of the room into the hallway. Interior, school hallway, day. Mr. Drummond walks up to Mr. Milner, invading his space in an intimidating manner. Interior, Mr. Drummond's office, day. Eddie enters the office and we see Mr. Drummond seated at a large wooden desk that has no worldly reason being in a school. Also in the corner is an expensive red upright piano. Mr. Drummond is posed, trying to look intimidating. Mr. Drummond doesn't afford any eye contact or respect to Eddie. Please have a seat, Mr. Cole. Let's have a chat. Mr. Cole, who do you want to be? Do you want to be that music student that looks, comes out of here working a dead-end job and only playing piano on the weekends? Or do you want to put in the work and be the musician that I know that you can be? Um, I don't know who I'm going to be, but I do know that you're not the one who is going to tell me. You see, Mr. Cole, this is what I'm talking about. Your ego. My ego. I beg your pardon, Mr. D. Uh, I've known I've known since I was nine that I wanted to play jazz. You pushing me to play classical has been unbearable. Mr. Cole, you're a talented pianist, but without my instruction, you're not going to get into Juilliard or any other collegiate program. I make stars. I don't want to be a star. I want to be a musician. I know that I'm a meal ticket to you in this school. My granddad hit me with that, to, hit me to the game. To you, I'm a wind-up toy for donors, boosters, and corporations. I know the hustle, but, and I'm going to play what I want to play for Juilliard, not what you want me to play. Mr. John stands up, taking a defensive stance towards Eddie. So you know everything, huh? No, I'm, I know a lot, but not everything. I know jazz. Jazz, jazz, jazz. Okay. 
Let's have a music lesson. Let's see what you know, Mr. Jazz Man. Mr. Drummond saunters over to the flashy red piano in the corner of the office. He opens it, exposing the keys. He leans on the piano in a cocky manner. Eddie stands up and takes a seat at the piano. Oh, you want to do this? Okay. Anything with a keyboard, I'm a beast. Yeah. Let's do this. I want the stride piano of Art Tatum. Eddie, seated at the piano, starts playing in the style of Art Tatum. It's the ability to play the background for yourself, and it's creating your own rhythm section. Next. Uh, yeah. All right. I want to hear a double octave melody line. Eddie starts to play the required riff with both hands briskly and proficiently. You're just inviting a line and playing it with both hands. Next. We see that Mr. Drummond is starting to fume at the accuracy of Eddie's piano playing. Okay. Give me a two-finger percussive and a chord. Eddie starts playing the jazz style requested. Suddenly, Mr. Drummond moves alongside the piano and quickly grabs the keyboard lid, tries to slam the piano lid down on Eddie's fingers out of spite. Eddie quickly anticipates the action, snatches his fingers out of harm's way. The room is silent now. Eddie looks at Mr. Drummond. Your reputation precedes you, Mr. D. Get out of my office now. Eddie stands up, slowly walks out of the office, fade out. <laughs>